Hello, my name is Katherine Kasdorf and I'm Associate Curator of Arts of Asia and the Islamic World at the Detroit Institute of Arts. I'm thrilled to be collaborating with the Museum of Art and Photography in Bengaluru on their Museums Without Borders series. In this edition, we bring two South Asian goddess sculptures into dialogue with one another. One, in the collection of MAP, depicts the goddess Brahmani. The other, which now resides at the DIA, is a type of goddess known as the Yogini. These two goddesses may have their share of differences. Most noticeably, the Yogini appears ferocious and threatening, whereas the Brahmani looks more serene. But as we'll see, they also have a few things in common. Both sculptures date to about the 10th century, or possibly the late 9th, and they come from different parts of southern India. The Yogini was carved in the northern part of Tamil Nadu, when that region was in a transitional moment between the Pallava and Chola periods. The Brahmani comes from southern Karnataka, most likely in a region ruled by the Nolamba dynasty, though political borders were similarly fluid there. Expertly chiseled in stone, an expensive medium, both sculptures must have cost their patrons a significant sum. These patrons may have belonged to royal families, or they could have been other elite individuals, such as members of a court or wealthy merchants. The sculptures were carved on different scales. The Yogini, with her curved backdrop rising up 117 centimeters or 46 inches, is human-sized, while the Brahmani is 70 centimeters or 27 and a half inches tall. The artists who made them paid great attention to detail, chiseling each element of the goddess's jewelry and even individual strands of hair. Looking at the sculptures side by side, a few similarities are immediately apparent. The goddesses are seated in similar positions, although the yogini crosses her feet and sways while the brahmani sits upright. Both goddesses have four arms, though one of the yoginis is now missing, and their curvaceous bodies, decked with bracelets, necklaces, and other jewelry, are informed by similar conventions pertaining to ideals of female beauty and the importance of adornment in South Asian visual culture historically. But the yogini is adorned with more than just jewelry. Where we would expect to see armlets and a sacred thread, live snakes wind their way around her body, rearing their hooded heads. These snakes are one of many features that signal the yogini's fierce or ugra character. She also fixes her face in a menacing expression, staring out under her bulging eyes, an intensely furrowed brow, and opening her mouth to bare teeth and fangs. Her unbound hair radiates around her head with a wild energy. The cup she holds in her lower left hand is understood to be made from a human skull and she sits above a headless corpse which is carved into low relief on her pedestal. In her upper hands, she holds a shield and a club, martial objects that can be used both to harm and to protect, as the scholar Padma Kaimal has pointed out. Drawing attention to the twofold nature of these weapons, Kaimal also makes the larger point about the character of yoginis themselves. They embody both auspicious and inauspicious qualities, dismantling binaries at every turn. Yoginis, as their iconography suggests, are extremely powerful. As goddesses associated with tantric traditions, their power is in part connected to their overturning of orthodox norms and their embracing of what is commonly considered impure. Objects like the skull bowl this yogini holds, or the corpse she sits upon. They guard tantric teachings from the uninitiated, restricting the powerful knowledge of these traditions to the initiated few. To individuals who hold this knowledge, and who correctly perform the arduous practices it demands, yoginis may grant great powers, even supernatural powers such as the ability to fly, the ability to become very large or very small, victory over one's enemies, and other magical abilities. But to individuals who do not follow their practices correctly, a yogini can be lethal. A yogini does not act alone, however. They always occur in groups. Most commonly, texts refer to groups of 64 yoginis, though they may occur in other numbers too. Imagine this goddess then, accompanied by potentially dozens of others like her, all enshrined together. Although the temple for which they were carved no longer survives, other yogini temples do, especially in the states of Odisha and Madhya Pradesh. These temples are usually circular in form, though some are rectangular, 
and the dozens of powerful goddesses they house are enshrined around the inner periphery of the structure, facing inward. Often, a fierce form of the god Shiva is enshrined at the center. The temples are open to the sky, a feature that scholars such as Shaman Hatley connect with the yogini's ability to fly. The Yogini sculpture that is now at the DIA is one of several that were found together in the region of Kanchipuram, Tamil Nadu in 1926 by the French archaeologist Gabriel Javu Dubreuil and his Indian associate Tunga Velu. We know that the sculptures were no longer in their original temple at this time. Indeed, no trace of that temple is known to exist. The exact context in which they were found, and just how Tonga Velu and Juveau Dubreuil negotiated their acquisition, are matters that are not entirely clear. These questions are the subject of ongoing research. In the late 1920s, Juveau Dubreuil sold 16 sculptures, including 10 yoginis, to the Paris-based art dealer C.T. Lou, and in the ensuing decades, they entered various collections across Europe and North America. One of the Yogini sculptures remains at the Government Museum in Chennai. Around the same time that Tanga Belu and Shivu Dubroy collected the Yoginis, they also collected a number of other sculptures. One of these, now housed at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, is a Brahmani sculpture very similar in size to the one in Map's collection. Brahmani, as her name suggests, is related to the god Brahma, and they share many of the same attributes. Most distinctively, Brahmani has four heads like Brahma, although only three are carved in the map and AAM sculptures. She also holds a rosary or akshamala and a water pot or kamandalu. We see those two objects in her two upper hands. The map Brahmani holds her lower right hand in the gesture of protection and reassurance, a bhaya mudra. The object she holds in her lower left hand is worn and not fully identifiable, Perhaps it was meant to represent a lotus pod. The hand that holds it makes a gesture of generosity, Varada Mudra, the same gesture that the Asian Art Museum Brahmani makes with her lower left hand. Brahmani belongs to a group of seven or sometimes eight goddesses known as Matakas or mothers. They're not mothers in a conventional sense, although one of their origin stories positions them collectively as mother of the god Skanda. In another origin story, they arise to help the supreme goddess, Devi, in her fight against the demons Shumba and Nishumba. Many of the Matrikas, including Brahmani, are female counterparts of male gods and share many of those gods' attributes. For instance, Vaishnavi relates to Vishnu, Aindri to Indra, Maheshwari to Maheshwara or Shiva, and the boar-faced Varahi to Vishnu's boar incarnation, Varaha. They are not seen as consorts or components of these gods, however, but as aspects of Devi, the great goddess. Despite the tame appearance of Brahmani and many of the other matrikas, though not all the matrikas, uh, the skull-bearing emaciated Jamunda is also part of the group, matrikas have a fierce side. In Puranic traditions, they defeat demons on the battlefield and then drink their blood. In earlier traditions, they're even fiercer and more dangerous. This blending of Ugra and Saumya, ferocious and gentle, is similar to the combination of threatening and alluring qualities we see in the Yogini. In fact, Yoginis and Matrikas are closely related. Early texts about Yoginis describe them as belonging to clans led by Matrikas, and some Yogini temples enshrine Matrikas too. More commonly, however, shrines to Matrikas are associated with temples to the god Shiva, and this is the most likely context for which the map Brahmani was carved. Usually, matrikas are placed in the southwestern area of a Shiva temple, whether in their own separate shrine or along the plinth in the main hall of the temple. We aren't sure where all of this Brahmani's companion matrikas are now, but much like yoginis, they would have manifested their power, their shakti, collectively. Today, in Bengaluru, in Detroit, and elsewhere, these goddesses, even on their own, still project an unmistakable power. Thank you.